um uh, welcome back everybody uh, hope you had a nice day uh, we are going to continue from where we left in the yesterday's uh, session so i am just going to have a quick recall of whatever that we did in the yesterday's session so yesterday's session was actually uh, continued from the first day where we actually started off uh, discussing about so what we did in the yesterday's uh, session was actually uh, we uh, completed the question that we had attempted earlier and in addition to attempting that question what we did was uh, we actually uh, we actually uh, uh, performed the audit procedure we did understand that what exactly are the audit procedures all about and we talked about the sufficiency and appropriateness of the audit evidence in accordance with either 500 uh we talked about uh, how the audit procedures are being uh, developed and how do we actually perform them furthermore we attempted one or two of the questions pertaining to that then i actually moved on to the next stage of the audit and that next stage of the audit was actually the finalization or the review stage of the audit and in the review stage of the audit what i did talk about was uh i discussed that uh, when it comes to review so what happens is that uh, at the planning stage the risk were identified at the performance stage the audit procedures were performed and then the next step was actually uh, that the working papers were the working papers got ready and they were presented to the senior manager or the partner and the senior manager or the partner they actually would have reviewed the working paper and uh, in case if there is a sufficient and appropriate audit evidence that was obtained they move they would move on to finalization if no then they would actually suggest additional audit procedures to be performed so we talked about it that a typical requirement would be comment on matters to be considered and a state the audit evidence that you would expect to find in your review of the audit working paper so we did talk about that uh, what exactly do we mean by this so we discussed that when it comes to comment on the matters you need to talk about the materiality you need to calculate materiality you need to discuss the accounting treatment and you need to discuss the risk involved and in addition to the audit evidence we talked about it that the audit evidence is basically the result of the audit procedures that you perform so whenever we do perform the audit procedures so audit procedures are the actions that we perform the evidence are the results of an action so that's what the audit evidence is all about so we discussed about it and then uh, we attempted a question in fact we attempted the question partially so what we are going to do now is that we are now going to continue the question uh, that we did uh, leave uh, yesterday but uh, before i move forward i would uh, actually take a short break for the prayers for the namaz uh, once we are done with namaz then we will uh, resume and we will move forward so i am actually going to take a break uh, till 6 um 6:18 p.m. so i'm going to take a break till 6:18 p.m. and then we are going to uh resume
Okay, uh, welcome back. So let's just uh, resume uh, where we left uh, yesterday. And uh, what we had been doing yesterday was this. Uh... Okay, what we were up to on uh, yesterday's class was. Uh, this uh, question number uh, four of uh, May June 2007 March June 2017 uh, question number four part C warranty provision now uh, let's just uh, talk about this warranty provision that what exactly is it Okay, now, um, so the requirement again is comment on the matters to be considered and explain the audit evidence you should expect to find during your file review in respect of each of the issues described above. So basically now this is this warranty provision. If I talk about the warranty provision, so what am I going to do is that the warranty provision it says each year management makes a provision uh, for the jewelry return under the warranty. It is based upon an estimate of the returns of the level for each product, rings, bracelet, necklaces, watches, etc. Uh, and is calculated on an annual basis by the sales director. The breakdown for the current provision from the notes to the financial is as follows. First April 2016, 11.5. Provisions charged during the year is 0.5. Provisions utilized during the year is 1.9. And the unutilized provision which is reversed is 3.1. And then there is this 31st March 2017, the provision has gone down by 7 million. Now, if I actually talk about it, uh, the provision, basically what we need to do is that we need to calculate the materiality. So, May, June 2017, question number 4, and uh, this is part C of this question number 4. So, if I talk about this, uh, we need to calculate the materiality. So, materiality is going to be calculated for... Uh, the materiality is going to be calculated for uh, number one, the provision balance. So if we calculate the provision balance, it's going to be 7 divided by, it's going to be 7 divided by, uh, it's going to be 7 divided by the total assets. So what are the total assets? The total assets uh, are 1919 million. So it is 1919. So you will end up getting a provision balance. And what is that provision balance going to be? 0.36% okay so it is just 0.36% meaning it's not material it's just 0.36% but uh, if we actually talk about uh, the uh, expense uh, or the income that's recognized during the year the reversal of the provision that reversal of the provision is approximately uh, if you could actually see the reversal of the provision because the provision has actually gone down from 11.1 uh, to 7. That means there is a 4.5 reversal. The 4.5 reversal has to be compared with the PBT of 107. 4.5 has to be compared with the PBT of 107 uh, giving you an amount of what? four point two percent of the profit before tax now if we actually talk about it so what we are going to do is that we're going to say that uh, provision for uh, warranty provision for warranty is not material to the financial statements the provision as it is only 0.36% of 0.36% of total uh, assets and 4.2% of PBT. So 
So it is actually going to be a uh, provision for warranty is actually not material to the financial statement as it is only 0.36% of the total assets and 4.2% of the profit before tax. Now if I move uh, forward, if I discuss further, so what am I actually going to do is that I'm going to say it's not material but it's still. Uh, if we discuss the accounting treatment pertaining to it, so what could actually be the matters to consider? So the matters to consider is basically uh, that uh, the a very important point is that there is going to be a separate provision for every type of item that's being sold. Now there is a warranty. Uh, there is a provision for. Uh, there's a provision for warranty, but the point is that there has to be a provision which is separate for each type of which is separate for each item and utilization of provision should only be against the provision made for the relevant item. Like for example, if there is a earrings, if there is a provision with respect to earrings, and if let's say that the necklace is returned, if let's say that necklace is returned, then what would happen is that uh, the provision of necklace shall not be offset against that of earrings. So that is what it is, and uh, the provision separate for each item. Utilization should be made for the, against the uh, for the relevant item. Uh, earrings, the necklace is returned. Provision of necklace should not be offset. So that's what the risk is that uh, the provision is understated. Number two, provision of one item offset against the other, resulting in understatement of provision so basically in order to address these you would have the evidences which is management representation historical trend of returns No, uh, number and name of either is not important. So management representation, historical trends of the returns. So these are a few important things which you need to actually, uh, which we should have that the management returns, the historical trends of the returns, and at the same time, uh, comparison of or the extracts from the uh, provision ledger to confirm that provision of alternate item is not offset against other item provision of an item is not offset against other item No, you can't use the short forms. You can't use short forms. So I think we are done with this question. What we are going to do is that we are going to move forward and we are going to do one similar type of a question. Um, and uh, that question is actually uh, the question that the next question that we are going to do is. You have the questions uh, in this uh, handout section. 
So what we are going to do is that June 2015, uh, we're going to do this June 2015. Okay, so the next question is June 2015, question number 2, part A. June 2015, question number 2, part A. Next question is June 2015, question 2, part A. Uh, please take 5-7 uh, minutes to attempt this part and then uh, we will uh, discuss.
So um, let's just start off this June 2015 uh, question number two. So June 2015 question number two again the questions requirement is the same which is in respect of the issues described in respect of the issues described or uh, above comment on the matters to be considered and explain the audit evidence you should expect to find in your review of the audit working papers. So this is what it is and uh, the question actually says that uh, the Adder group has been an audit client for your firm for several years. You have recently been assigned to act as an audit manager replacing a manager so and so for the year ended 31st March 2015 is underway. Now it says that uh, the group's uh, activities include property management and provision of large storage facilities in warehouses. Draft consolidated financial statement recognized total assets of 150 and profit before tax of 20 million. So it says the draft financial statements recognize uh, total assets of 150 million and the profit before tax of 20 million. Uh, it says the audit engagement partner Edmund Blank has asked you to review the audit working papers in relation to two audit issues which have been highlighted by the audit senior. Information of these issues is given below. <clears throat> now, it says in December 2014, so which year end are we talking about? 31st March. Uh, December 2014 Ledger Center complex was sold for proceeds equivalent to its fair value of 35 million. The related assets have been de-recognized from the group statement of financial position and a profit and disposal of 8 million is included in the group SOFP. The remaining life of the ledger complex was 21 years at the date of disposal. The group is leasing back the ledger center complex to use in its ongoing operations paying a rental based on the market rental uh, plus 22 percent at the end of the 20 year lease agreement the group has the option to purchase uh, the ledger center complex for its market value at that time. Now, so if you analyze this scenario, this is a scenario of sale and leaseback. This is a scenario of sale and leaseback. Now see, uh, number one thing is, uh, if I do talk about it, 8 million divided by, 8 million divided by 20 million profit uh, gives you a 40 million, 8 million gives you divided by, this gives you 40% of the PBT. This is 40% of the profit before tax. Now, if this is 40% of the profit before tax, so let's just uh, talk about it. If this is 40% of the profit before tax, that means it's a material item. Now, IFRS 16 leases actually talks about the sale and lease back transaction. Now in accordance with IFRS 16, the sale and leaseback transaction, what we do need to understand is that uh, uh, how, how shall we recognize the sale and leaseback transaction, then it actually depends upon that uh, uh, this, uh, that depends upon whether the sale transaction, whether the sale transaction qualifies the criteria for recognition under IFRS 15. So the number one thing that you need to do is that you need to see if the sale transaction qualifies the criteria for recognition under IFRS 15. So if it's yes, then uh, gain or loss, gain slash loss shall be recognized to the extent of right of use of the asset transferred. And if it is no, then uh, it has to be treated as financial liability. So now in this case, what we need to do is that the first thing that we need to do in accordance with IFRS uh, 16 is we need to evaluate if the sale transaction meets the criteria for uh, recognition uh, under IFRS 15. like. Uh, under IFRS 15, the revenue is recognized. Under IFRS 15, the revenue is recognized uh, when the uh, when the performance obligation is satisfied. So, generally speaking, what we need to do is that have we been able to transfer the significant risk and rewards associated with the asset? If we have been able to transfer significant risk and rewards associated with the asset, 
so that's what so that's what uh, we actually need to uh, assess so apparently if you see the asset has a life of 21 years and the asset is being leased for 20 years now this is um, if you see that the asset is being used for the major part of its life by this adder group so apparently the risk and rewards have been transferred and the sale meets the recognition criteria so that means that uh, this is a case where yes is the answer or yes is the call so what we need to do is that we need to recognize the gain or loss to the extent of right of use of the asset transferred now so what you need to do is you need to suggest them that gain of dollar 8 million shall be reversed and replaced with a gain of shall be reversed and replaced with a gain determined in accordance with so the gain of dollar 8 million shall be reversed and replaced with a gain determined in accordance with uh, IFRS 16 based upon the right of use transferred to the lessor to the buyer lessor additionally the entity has to recognize the right of use of the asset retained and lease obligation lease obligation is to be splitted between current and non current portion Now, what are the evidences that we are going to expect? So you need to think about the risks that are there in this given scenario. So the evidences would actually be driven from the risk because the risk would drive the procedure and the procedure would devise the, drive the evidences. So if I talk about it, so number one thing is whenever we talk about the evidences. So evidences are going to be uh, the sale and leaseback arrangement. The sale and leaseback arrangement. Uh, the number one, number two thing is that the ROU calculation, lease obligation calculation extracts from SOFP showing segregation of liability into current and non current portion so these are the various things that you're gonna do and you're gonna say so this is part A so I hope that everybody is actually understanding that how do we actually go about it now next uh, portion in this question is in January 15 the group acquired 52 percent of the equity shareholdings of Bordrake company this company has not been consolidated has not been consolidated into the group as a subsidiary and is instead accounted for as an associate so they have not consolidated it instead they have accounted for using equity method the group finance director reason for this treatment is that Baldrick company's operations have not yet been integrated with those of the rest of the group uh, the SOFP recognized total assets of 18 million and a profit or loss for the year of 5 million dollar now 
if i actually talk about it number one thing is that uh, the subsidiary has a total asset of 18 million divided by subsidiary has a total assets of 18 million divided by 150 million so this is probably going to be material now so the subsidiary sorry the baldrick company is a material component of the group financial statements i first then prescribes that control is set to exist when so number one thing is that the Baldrick company is a material component of the group financial statement. IFRS 10 prescribes that the control is set to exist when the when an entity is a, when an entity is able to an entity has power over investee. So uh, If an entity is a subsidiary, it shall be it shall be consolidated even if it has not been properly integrated. However, if only if only significant influence is exercised over entity then it shall be accounted for as associate so what we need to do is that we need to talk about that uh, there is a risk that it is incorrectly classified as associate rather than a subsidiary resulting in complete misstatement of financial statements. So the evidences are obviously shareholding, share purchase agreements, board minutes, extracts, Okay, so this is basically, uh, this is uh, June 2015, question number, uh, uh, question number um, two, part A, which actually pertain to this uh, area of uh, uh, the um, uh, review or the finalization stage of the audit, which requires that uh, uh, you comment on matters to be considered and you state the audit evidence that you would expect to find in your review of the audit working papers. So we have actually gone through this area and what we are now going to do is that we are now going to move forward and we are going to discuss further. So basically, uh, we have been discussing over the past two days that what actually happens is that uh, basically the working papers are uh, being prepared and once the working papers are, there, are being prepared, then there is a review of the finalization stage and once there is a review of the finalization stage, then what happens is uh, there is this uh, reporting uh, which is you either uh, conclude or draw the report or you either actually um, uh, suggest additional audit procedures to be performed. So now uh, what we have actually done till now is we have discussed up till the finalization stage. So the next stage that we are going to move on to is the audit reporting stage. 
So the next stage that we are going to move on to is the audit reporting stage ISA 700 series. Uh, you would have got the handouts uh, in this uh, screen where there are uh, basically two handouts attached. One of them is for the audit report and the other one of them is audit report 2. So these are the two handouts that are there in the, uh, that are there. So kindly actually, Uh, please download these handouts so we could discuss them. Okay, um, so the next is basically we are going to go through this uh, audit reporting which is ISA 700 series. So we've got the key ISAs which are ISA 700, ISA 701, ISA 705, ISA 706, ISA 710, and ISA 720. So these are the various ISAs which are important and what we are going to do is that we are now going to go through them and we are going to discuss these ISAs that uh, what exactly are these uh, ISAs all about and how the audit reporting actually goes about. So <clears throat> you see number one of them is uh, there are few important things which needs to be understood with respect to the audit report. Uh, I think the audit report handouts that are being attached to this uh, uh, webinar window they are they are opening they are opening up I have myself downloaded from this webinar window so I think you all can also download Abra these handouts are gonna open this is these handouts are gonna open Janesh, you mentioned that 52% shareholding, 52% shareholding is no indication of control. It's going to open. It's, it's, not, it's okay. I mean, the file is okay. Anyways, uh, now let's just uh, talk about this uh, audit report. 
So number one thing is that I'm going to go through the audit report first and I'm going to discuss a few things. A lot of you are aware about the changes that have actually arisen with respect to the audit report and you do have an idea that what are the changes that have actually taken place. The audit report format used to be a very different format but now the format has uh, changed a lot and how the format has been changed a lot so I'm going to highlight few important things. Number one, if I talk about the audit report, the audit report has a set format and that format needs to be followed by every single entity, every single audit firm uh, auditing under the ISA and uh, 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 publishing a report under ISA should always be doing, should always be following the ISA 700. So now how does the report start? This report actually starts off with the title and that is the independent auditor's report. So this is actually the title to this report. Uh, number two, so this is actually the title to the report. <laughs> uh, the next one of them is basically once we are done with the title, the next area is that this is uh, actually the addressee that the shareholders are the addressee of this report. Uh, then the third para is actually the third portion is actually the opinion portion. And in the opinion portion you would see that the auditor is mentioning that we have audited the financial statements of XYZ company uh, comprising so and so as at 31st December so and so. Uh, at the same time, this is actually an introduction para. This is an introduction para. And immediately after the introduction para, they actually give an opinion. They give an opinion. So, uh, what is this opinion? In our opinion, the accompanying financial statements present fairly or the given true and fair view of the financial position of so and so, so and so. Uh, the next stage is basically uh, the basis for opinion. And what exactly is the basis for opinion? So, in basis for opinion, earlier it used to be the case that the basis for opinion paragraph only used to come when there used to be some qualifications or modification. But now, the basis for opinion paragraph is actually a mandatory para. So, it says we conducted our uh, audit in accordance with the AIDA and uh, our responsibilities uh, are further described and so and so. Uh, the important point is it mentions that we are independent of the company in accordance with IESBA and we have fulfilled our ethical. We believe that audit evidence we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our opinion. So if I talk about this basis for opinion section, earlier it never used to be there in the unmodified report but now it's there in the unmodified report that you have to give the basis for opinion. And the basis for opinion section would actually cover up that we are an independent auditor in accordance with the IESBA code of ethics and at the same time the evidence that we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate evidence that we have obtained. Uh, the next area is basically the key audit matter. So the key audit matters are actually covered up by ISA 701. I'm going to discuss a few things about this either 701 key audit matters. So what exactly is this key audit matters in accordance with either 701? Let's just talk about it. If I talk about these key audit matters, so let me let me have a quick discussion about what exactly are the key audit matters. Uh, the ISA 701, the introduction of ISA 701 has led to audit report becoming a very complex exercise. Earlier it used to be a very simple exercise. I mean the report format never used to change. But now every single company whose report would be prepared, it would be a different report to the other company. And the only difference area is going to be this key audit matter section of the report. Now, what exactly are the key audit matters? So key audit matters are those matters that in the auditor's judgment, in the auditor's judgment, are of such significance that they should be highlighted in the report. Now, 
uh, in fact, you write matters that are in the auditor's judgment are of such significant. Uh, in fact, what you need to do is that matters that have been discussed with management and those charged with governance, those charged with governance. So what are the key audit matters? Key audit matters are the matters that have been discussed with management and those charged with governance and in the auditor's judgment and in the auditor's judgment are such of such significance that they should be reported or highlighted in the report. They are the key audit matters. So now, uh, what exactly are the key audit matters? Uh, we discuss a lot of matters with the management and those charged with governance. So amongst the various matters that we discuss with management and those charged with governance, those matters which the auditor believe are of a very high significance, those matters are actually termed as the key audit matters. What are the examples of the key audit matters? Maybe the revenue recognition policy. Maybe the revenue recognition policy. Or maybe the uh, maybe the impairment testing. Maybe the goodwill calculation. Maybe the going concern assumption. A lot of factors could actually fall under the key audit matter. It says that the matter should have been discussed with management and those charged with governance and the auditor should believe that it is such an important matter that it should be discussed in the report. So what exactly do you need to do with respect to the key audit matter, the CAM? Uh, what you need to do is that you need to actually discuss the matter and its significance and state the actions slash procedures that an auditor has performed with respect to this matter. So the key audit matter is a very important part that whenever we do have a key audit matter, the key audit matter section what you need to do is that you need to discuss the matter and its significance and you need to state the action of the procedure that the auditor has performed with respect to this matter. So here you see the audit report format that immediately after the opinion or the basis for opinion there is this key audit matter section. And in the first part of the key audit matter section the uh, there is actually a discussion that key audit matters are those matters that in our professional judgment were of most significance in our audit and uh, these matters are addressed in the context of our audit so and so and uh, we do not provide a separate opinion on these matters. Now very important point is we do not provide a separate opinion on these matters. That's a very important point.
Okay, uh, sorry, there was some problem. Uh, actually, our administrator was a bit concerned about one or two of the students asking for the slides. So, uh, there are no slides. There is actually just uh, these uh, PDF files or the handouts. And if and whatever I'm writing on this Word document, we would make sure that during the break time we actually upload it. So, coming back to it, I was discussing that what exactly is a CAM. The CAM actually he discusses the matter that are of significance so what you need to do is that you need to discuss the matter you need to discuss its significance and you need to state the action or the procedure that the auditor that an auditor has performed with respect to this matter so basically there could be multiple key audit matters there is not going to be one key audit matter there could be multiple key audit matters so you need to just list down every single key audit matter in a separate section over here over here and you need to actually uh, discuss that what's the matter why is it a significant matter and what as an auditor you have done with respect to this matter okay so uh, the next portion of the report is basically the other information the next portion of the report is actually the other information uh, other than the financial statement the auditors report now what exactly is this other information section so let's just uh, have a quick discussion about this other information section. If I talk about this other information section, uh, what I'm going to request you people to do is that there are two audit, uh, there are two files. There's a second file which is uh, audit report two. If you go into that file, audit report two, so uh, you would find this. Uh, this extract which is on the page number three of the PDF file is in the page number three of the PDF file the auditors responsibilities relating to the other information now there is this ISA which is ISA 720 and this is actually about other information so ISA 720 is actually about the other information. So ISA 720 is about the other information. Now let's just talk about it. What exactly is it? If I talk about this ISA 720 other information, so what are the other information? The other information are those information which accompany the financial statement, but they're not actually financial. There are a few examples of other information that are given here. Uh, like for example, items in a summary of key financial results such as net income, earnings, etc. Selected operating data. So basically whatever that is part and parcel of the annual report, but has not been, is not part and parcel of financial statement is other information. Like, uh, uh, you've got financial measures such as ratios or etc explanation of critical accounting estimates and related assumptions etc etc so there could actually be a lot of other information which could accompany financial statement now so uh, basically what does ISA 720 state so we need to actually understand what does ISA 720 state so audit report 2 uh, page number 6 of the PDF file audit report 2 page number 6 of the PDF file what does it say it says other information management is responsible for other information who is responsible management is responsible the other information comprises the information included in the X report but does not include the financial statement and our auditor report now what is this X report that could be CSR report that could be etc etc there could be many reports so what is other information other information is the information that accompanies financial statements now what next our opinion on the financial does not cover the other information and we do not express any form of assurance conclusion thereon. Okay. Now a few of you would actually ask a question that if you're not going to give an opinion on the other information, if your uh, audit report, audit opinion is not going to discuss the other information, then why do we need to mention this section? The reason behind that is the financial statements are being accompanied by this other information. A lot of people actually make a mistake by reviewing the other information, concluding the information on the basis of that. So therefore it became imperative, it became important for 
this uh, IASB to actually revise this IDA and to make the audit report more elaborative, more comprehensive, more detailed. So now, what we do is that we say that we are not responsible. Management is responsible for the information. As an auditor, we are not responsible. As an auditor, we are not expressing an opinion on the other information. Yes, but our responsibility is to read the other information. Our responsibility is to read the other information. So we are going to read the information. Our responsibility is to read the other information and in doing so, consider whether the information is materially inconsistent with financials or our knowledge obtained in the audit. Now, if there is a material inconsistency in the other information and the financial statements, what you need to do is that, uh, let's, let's just talk about if material inconsistency, then what do we need to do? We need to review the work performed. We need to review the work performed if there is a still an inconsistency found. Discuss with management and those charged with governance. If no response, mention about material, mention about material misstatement of other information. Okay, so this is actually done. Then the, uh, the next part of the audit report is actually the responsibility of management and those charged with governance, it's not changed. The only change is that the, 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 the reference to those charged with governance in now this uh, specific section and there is actually an explanation that who are management, who are those charged with governance. So it says management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of financials and for internal control that management determines it to, ne to be necessary that are free from material misstatements, etc, etc. Now, Next responsibility is the auditor's responsibility for the audit of financial. There you mentioned that our objectives are to obtain reasonable assurance or about uh, reasonable assurance. And furthermore, what happens is that we need to mention that reasonable assurance is a high level of assurance, but not a guarantee that the audit conducted in accordance with always detect a material misstatement will exist. So this is what it is all about. So when you prepare the audit report, the format has actually changed and now the format actually encompasses a lot of things. Now there is this report or other regulatory requirements. So a lot of countries, there are specific legal requirement, regulatory requirements. Those are covered here. Uh, the engagement partner, etc, etc. Now, so this is a general overview of the audit report. So we are done with it. Uh, what we are going to do now is that we are now going to move forward and we are going to discuss further. So the next item that we are going to discuss is going to be the modifications.
Okay, so basically one of them is the unmodified opinion. Now what we are going to do is that we are going to talk about the modifications. So there are modifications that actually do happen are of uh, number one. Uh, the modifications that do actually happen are of uh, we've got one of them is a qualified opinion, other it is worse and the third one of them is a disclaimer of opinion. Now let's just uh, talk about it that what exactly are these modifications and when do we actually modify the financials etc etc. Let's have a quick discussion. Now if I say the financials are actually modified on the basis of two things. Now what are those two things? One of them is material misstatement and the, th the second one of them is uh, insufficient and inappropriate audit evidence. Now, so if we do talk about the modifications, if we do talk about the modifications, the modifications are only going to arise with respect to the two things and uh, when exactly are going to be the modifications arising, one of them is when there is a material misstatement and the other one of them is when there is this insufficient and inappropriate audit evidence, that's when the modification is going to arise. So now, uh, let's just uh, talk about it, that what exactly happens and how. So you see, uh, a very important point of what sort of modified opinion is going to be presented is uh, whether the modification, whether the, whether the issue is pervasive or non-pervasive. Now, what is very important point is, is the, the very important point is that what is going to be the type of opinion that would depend upon that the issue or the matter under consideration, is it a pervasive matter or a non-pervasive matter? Now, what exactly do we mean by pervasive matter and what exactly do we mean by non-pervasive matter? So, let's just have a quick discussion about it. See, the pervasive matter is basically when uh, more than one element of financial statement is affected or maybe one element is significantly affected or maybe so basically whenever we do talk about the pervasiveness the pervasiveness is actually when more than one elements of financials are affected. That means there is a material misstatement in more than one items. Inventory are misstated, receivable are misstated, the payables are misstated, the cash is misstated. That's a material misstatement in multiple items. That's a pervasive matter. Now one element is significantly affected. Significantly affected. Now what is this significantly? The significantly is a very judgmental call. The significantly, significantly is a judgment call. Now, if significantly the judgment call, then what is significant? Significant is basically more than 15% uh, of uh, more than 20% more than 20% of net assets generally. So one of the issue is that uh, what you need to do, what you need to do, and you need to see is that uh, that more than one element, or basically at times, fundamental disclosure has issues. So basically you need to see if the matter is pervasive or not. So whenever we talk about the modification, so the important point with respect to modification is you need to see whether the matter is pervasive or not. If the matter is pervasive, then the opinion differs. If the matter is non-pervasive, the opinion differs a bit. So now, how do we actually modify? Number one, you need to see 
the number one thing that you need to do is that uh, first of all uh, see this is actually the case where this matter is non pervasive so if it is non pervasive then no matter what happens if it is non pervasive no matter what happens I'm repeating it again if it is non pervasive no matter what happens the financial statement would have the audit report would have a qualified opinion but if it is material and pervasive then there is going to be a opinion which would be like if there is a material misstatement there would be an adverse opinion if there is an inability to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence then there would be a disclaimer of opinion so I'm gonna repeat you see you try and understand if there is a material misstatement you see the matter is pervasive it's uh, pervasive or non pervasive if it's non pervasive it's qualified if it's pervasive it's adverse that financial do not give a true answer secondly if you are unable to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence you need to see if the matter is pervasive or non pervasive if the matter is non pervasive then qualified opinion if the matter is pervasive then there is a disclaimer of opinion and what do we mean by disclaimer of opinion that we do not provide an opinion so I hope uh, it's all cleared up till now okay I did actually uh, give the example of uh, pervasive but uh, let me repeat basically pervasive is where more than one element of financial statement is affected so what do I mean by more than one element of financial statement being affected it's actually like this that uh, financial in when it comes to financial the receivables are misstated the payables are misstated the inventory is misstated that's that's actually at more than one element of financial is affected that's number one number two either one element is significantly affected you've got an inventory which constitutes around 25 percent of the net assets and it's misstated that's pervasive though it's a single item but then again it's pervasive or the fundamental disclosure has issues at times what happens is there are fundamental disclosure like going concerns or etc so that's a pervasive issue so if it if there is a pervasiveness and material misstatement then it has to be adverse if it is pervasive and inability to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence then you would actually give a disclaimer of opinion so if I talk about it that how do we actually uh, go with these modifications so let's have a quick quick uh, discussion on to them that how do we have the modifications now number one I uh, know there is no set percentages of uh, pervasiveness. It's all judgmental. Okay, uh, we're gonna take a short break of uh, ten minutes.
Okay, um, so welcome back everybody. Uh, we were actually discussing about the audit report and up till now what have we discussed with the audit report is that uh, we have talked about the format of an audit report, we have discussed about the changes and in addition to this we have also talked about that how ISA 701 which is the key audit matter and in addition to this how ISA uh, 720 actually come into come in between. So we have actually talked about them. Now what we need to do is that we now need to move forward and we need to discuss about the various modifications. So if I talk about the modifications, uh, if I talk about the modifications I did discuss that how do the modifications take place. So we talked about it that uh, for modification to actually take place what happens is uh, there could be either of the two reasons. There could either be material misstatement or there could either be inability to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. So now, if there is a material misstatement or inability to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence, so we need to actually see that the matter or the issue under consideration is a pervasive matter or a non-pervasive matter. So we talked about it that the pervasive matter is where more than one element of financial statement is affected or where one element is significantly affected or where there is a discussion, there is a problem with the fundamental disclosure. Somebody has actually uh, mentioned, I think it's uh, Naeem Shahzada, uh, whatever that you mentioned is correct, that uh, that if the financial statements become meaningless, then also it's a pervasive matter. Now, uh, let's move forward and let's just discuss that how do we actually go about with the modified uh, reports. So if there is a modified report, the heading of the opinion becomes a qualified opinion. Uh, the heading of the opinion becomes a qualified opinion. And uh, it says for the qualified opinion uh, in, our, in, in our opinion, except for the effects of the matter described in the basis for qualified opinion section of our report, financials give a true and fair way. So whenever there is a qualified report, the qualified report is just about except for the effects of the matters discussed in so and so, the financials give a true and fair way. So see the difference, the heading changes to qualified opinion and additionally there is except for the matters of the effects of the matters discussed so and so. Now, what next? I think there is some uh, problem with the file, just, just hold on for a second.
I'm hoping that the problem is fixed. Uh, anyways, uh, we were on to this uh, modification, so I was actually discussing that uh, there is this uh, difference in the heading, which is actually the qualified opinion. And in addition to this, uh, we say in our opinion, except for the effects of the matter discussed in the basis for qualified section of our report, etc., etc. Now, when we talk about the basis for qualified opinion, when we talk about the basis for qualified opinion, let's just talk about it. If I talk about the basis for qualified opinion, so the basis for qualified opinion is basically like this. That the company's inventory is carried in the statement of financial position at so and so. And uh, the management has not stated the inventory at the lower of cost or an RV. Which constitutes a departure from IFR. So what you do is that in the basis for opinion paragraph, you talk about the amount of misstatement and the and the correct accounting treatment and the effects of and the effects of rectification. So when we talk about this basis for qualified opinion, we talk about that what exactly is the issue and what should have been the correct treatment and also the effect of rectification. Accordingly, so we, we talk about uh, the effect of rectification also that had it been recognized that so and so, the effect would have been so and so, so and so. So this is one qualified opinion. Uh, the otherwise the key audit matter section, uh, you would see that the key audit matter section it just says in addition to the matter described in the basis for qualified opinion, we have determined the matters uh, described below to be the. So basically, it's just the qualified opinion. It's just the opinion section and the basis for uh, opinion section. These two things are actually changed. Then we talk about this disclaimer of opinion. Remember, whenever there is a disclaimer of opinion, there is no key audit matter uh, area in the report. Why? Because when it comes to the key audit matter area, we actually tend to say that uh, uh, we do not provide a separate opinion. So basically, um, uh, the key audit matter section is not there because we are actually not providing any opinion. So generally there is no key audit matter section whenever there is um, uh, this report which is actually a disclaimer of opinion. Now, so what I have done is I have discussed with you people about So uh, whatever what I've what I've done with you people is I've actually discussed about the modifications also. Now there is actually either 706, which is the emphasis of matter and other matter, emphasis of matter and other matter. Now let's talk about it. What is the emphasis of matter and other matter? So uh, we have got the definition of the emphasis of matter and the other matter paragraph. And what exactly are the definitions of these emphasis of matter and other matter paragraph? Let's just have a quick uh, go through of them. So these definitions, uh, it actually says that emphasis of matter paragraph is actually a paragraph included in the auditor's report that refers to a matter appropriately presented or disclosed in the financial statement that an auditor's judgment is of such important that it is fundamental to appropriate fundamental to user understanding now see when is emphasis of matter given what is emphasis of matter emphasis of matter is a paragraph included in the auditor report that refers to a matter appropriately presented or disclosed in the financials now so we know that if there is a matter which is appropriately presented in the financial, so there is an emphasis of matter paragraph with respect to it. What is other matter? Other matter is a paragraph included in the auditor's report that refers to a matter other than those presented or disclosed in the financials is relevant to user understanding, etc. Et now I need to give you a brief uh, understanding between the emphasis of matter versus the key audit matter. 
Now, first of all, try to understand this thing. Both discuss matter correctly discussed, uh, correctly uh, presented in financial statement, number one. So if I talk about the emphasis of matter and the key audit matter, so the first thing is both of them actually discuss the matter correctly presented in financial statement. EOM is not detailed. CAM is detailed. Okay. So why do we need why do we need CAM when there was already EOM? So we need CAM because CAM discusses area of high risk areas where there has been a discussion between auditor and the management. It is an area where extensive work is done by the auditor. So if I try to explain you in layman terms, if I try to explain you in layman terms, then in layman terms, key audit matter is provided for a matter which is correctly presented in financials, but on which the auditor and the management had an argument or a discussion and the auditor went on and performed additional procedures onto it. And EOM is a section which is actually referring to a matter which the management has correctly presented, the auditor had no objection, but it's a still a significant matter and the auditor wants to highlight it. So EOM and CAM, they refer to correctly presented matters, but EOM is, is something which is less risky, low risk, and CAM is something which is high risk. CAM is something where the auditor has performed a substantial work. So if I give you an example of this uh, EOM, so you would see that the emphasis of matter is basically we draw attention to note X to the financial statement which describe the effects of a fire in the company's production facilities, our opinion is not modified in respect of this matter. So basically what happens is when we talk about the emphasis of matter, so it simply says we draw attention to note X of the financials, which actually describe the effects of the fire or etc, etc, etc. So, uh, another important thing that you need to actually understand between EOM and CAM is that if a CAM is not correctly presented in financial statement, it becomes the basis for modified opinion. So if a CAM is not correctly presented in financials, it becomes the basis for modified opinion. Now, uh, what about the other matter? So what exactly is another matter? Other matter is then again, it's a matter that is, that is not pertaining to financials. Something that is not pertaining to financial statement that is given in the other matter section. So what's another matter section? Other matter section is something that is uh, not pertaining to the financials. That's actually the other matter section. Now, what is going to come in the other matter? So see, there used to be before the introduction of either 720, the other matter used to actually cover up a lot of things like uh, the inconsistency in the other information and etc. But now, either 720 covers that up. So the other matter only covers up few facts like the last year financials were not audited or etc, etc, things like that. So that's what is actually covered in the other matter. So I think we have had a quick uh, or a detailed discussion on this uh, audit report. Now what am I going to do next is uh, I'm going to now move on to one or two of the exam questions so you could actually have a better idea about how the audit uh, questions are actually dealt with. So, 
I would uh, request you people to open up uh, December 2015. December 2015, question number 5. December 2015, question number 5. Uh, Khwaja Bilal, no, there is no BP presentation. The word sheet would be emailed to you, don't worry. It's, uh, the name of the question is Rockwell and Co. So it's December 2015. Question number five, Rockwell Company.
Okay. Um, so let's just uh, start off this question. The requirement to this question is critically appraise the draft audit report of the Hopper Group for the year ended 30th June 2015 prepared by the audit senior. So what you need to actually do is that uh, you need to go through the audit report and you need to tell that what exactly are the issues with this audit report. So it says critically appraise the draft audit report. Now let's have a quick discussion on this. Number one, it says you are an audit manager at Rockwell & Co a firm of chartered certified accountants and you're responsible for the audit of Hopper Group, a listed audit client which supplies ingredients to food and beverage industries. Now, the audit work for the year ended 30th June is nearly complete and you are reviewing draft audit report which has been prepared by Audit Senior. During the year, the Hopper Group purchased a new subsidiary company, Sarat Sweeteners, which is expertise in the research and design of sugar alternatives. The draft financials recognize a profit of 495 million. Last year it was 462. And total assets of 4617. Last year it was 4751. An extract from the draft report is shown below. Now you see the the profits the profits have actually gone up. The profits have actually uh, the go the profits have actually gone up, and uh, what has actually happened is uh, the profits have actually gone up from 495 million to 462 million. The total assets uh, of 4617 million have actually gone down. Uh, in fact, the last year assets were 4751 million. This year they have become 4617 million, and it says an extract from the draft audit report is shown below. Now see. So if we if we actually talk about it, uh, what happens is you've got the draft finances of Hopper Group, etc. The profit before tax of 495 million. There is 2014. It was 462. Then there is this total assets and etc. etc. It says basis of modified opinion. Now our questions requirement is we need to critically appraise the draft audit report of the Hopper group we need to appraise the draft audit report of the Hopper group now what happens is that uh, we need to actually evaluate every single aspect it says in the calculation of the goodwill and the acquisition of the new subsidiaries the directors have failed to recognize consideration which is contingent upon meeting certain development targets the directors believe that it is unlikely that these targets will be met by the subsidiary and therefore have not recorded the contingent consideration the cost of acquisition. They have disclosed this contingent liability fully in the notes to the financials. We do not feel that the director's treatment of contingent consideration is correct and therefore do not believe the criteria of the relevant standard have been met. If this is the case, it would be appropriate to adjust the goodwill balance in the statement of financial position. If this is appropriate, it is going to be appropriate to adjust the goodwill balance in the financial. We believe that any required adjustment may materially affect the goodwill balance. Therefore, in our opinion, financial statements do not give a true and fair view. That means they have given an adverse opinion. And uh, uh, in addition to this, they have actually mentioned an emphasis of matter paragraph. And it says that uh, we draw attention to note to the financial statement which describes the uncertainty relating to the contingent consideration described above. The notes provided, the notes further, the note provides further information necessary to understand the potential implications of the contingency. Now, there are few things which need to be understood with respect to this uh, specific scenario. And what are those few things which need to be understood? Let's just uh, have a quick uh, discussion about them. Now, the first thing that needs to be understood with respect to this specific question is that uh, when we talk about critical appraisal, so the heading actually, it says that uh, basis for modified opinion. It could never be the mod basis for modified opinion. It has to be either the qualified or the adverse you have to name the relevant opinion. 
name the relevant opinion number 2 so what happens is you need to name the relevant opinion so first of all heading modified opinion and then you need to name the relevant opinion now what next what is number 2 number 2 thing that needs to be done is basically number 2 thing that needs to be done is that um, the directors uh, what they have done is in the calculation of goodwill on the acquisition of new subsidiary the directors have failed to recognize so you see the reference to director is inappropriate reference to directors is inappropriate it should have been entity it should not have been a one person furthermore the use of terminologies like directors believe that so the use of terminologies like directors believe these are inappropriate terminologies these are inappropriate terminology furthermore uh, if we say that um, Uh, the directors have failed to recognize consideration which is contingent upon meeting certain tar certain development targets director believe it is unlikely that these targets will be met by the subsidiary company and therefore have not recorded the contingent consideration in the cost of acquisition the basis for modification para para does not actually reflects to uh, the uh, value of uh, goodwill does not refers to the amount of contingent consideration does not refer to the correct accounting treatment does not discuss the effects of rectification and the uh, opinion in this case opinion in this case is apparently inappropriate opinion in this case is a, is, is 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 inappropriate now why is this opinion inappropriate the reason behind that is uh the goodwill ignores contingent consideration goodwill ignores contingent consideration it might not be a pervasive may not be pervasive therefore it is too harsh for an adverse for an adverse opinion to be provided furthermore the emphasis of matter para use is inappropriate why because it's only use when finances statements are correctly presented
So the questions requirement was critically appraised the draft audit report of the Hopper Group for the year ended so and so prepared by the audit senior. So we have actually gone through it. We've done it. Now there is this part B of this requirement which is the audit of new subsidiary Serot Sweeteners was performed by a different form of auditors Fish Associates. Uh, yes, we need to discuss the treatment so and so also. Uh, for the either 570 effects, I'm going to discuss it later on. Please wait for a bit. Now it says the audit of the new subsidiary Surat Sweeteners Company was performed by a different form of auditors, Fish Associates. During a review of the communication from Fish Associates, you note that they were unable to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence, sufficient appropriate evidence with regard to the breakdown of research expense. So you says the audit of the new subsidiary Surat Sweeteners Company was performed by a different form of auditors, Fish Associates. During your review of the communication from Fish Associates, you note that they were unable to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence with regard to breakdown of research expense. The total of research cost expense by Sarat during the year was 1.2. Fish Associate has issued a qualified audit opinion on the financials of Sarat due to this inability to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. Now, uh, what we need to do is that we now need to consider this 1.2 million on a total assets of 4616, 4616 million. So 1.2 million is the uh, any material amount. So you are going to discuss that part B, this uh, auditor of Serot sweeteners. One point two million is an immaterial amount. Furthermore, uh, it says comment on the actions which Rockwell and Co should take as the auditor of the Hopper Group and the implication for the auditor's report on the Hopper Group's financial statement. Now, what we need to do is that we need to communicate with the component auditor. And we need to discuss with them the reasons for modification. And uh, we need to discuss with them that uh, what made them issue a qualified opinion on an immaterial amount. One thing that needs to be considered is that 1.2 million may be material to the individual financial statements of Sirot, but they are definitely not material to the group financial statements. So there shall be no implications to the group financial statements. So we have actually gone through this uh, part of the um, uh, this question which is December 15. 
the next question that we are actually going to go for is March and June 2016. Next question is going to be March, June 2016. Question number five, which is actually about uh, Boston Company. This is actually about Boston Company. So it's March, June 2016, Boston Company. Okay, uh, March, June 2016, Boston Company, question number five. So it take five minutes to actually, five, seven minutes to go through it, and then we'll discuss.
Okay. Um, now, uh, let's talk about this uh, question, which is the question is uh, it says that uh, you are the manager responsible for the audit of Boston Company. A producer of chocolate and confectionery, the audit of financials for year ended is nearly complete and you're reviewing audit working papers. Financial recognized revenue of 75 million, PBT of 6.4 million and total assets of 104 million. Now it says summary of uncorrected misses statements included in Boston's audit working papers includes note is shown below the audit engagement partners holding a meeting so and so. Now, so these figures of revenue, uh, profit and total assets need to be actually uh, used for the uh, purposes of uh, for the purposes of calculating materiality. Now, number one is for the impairment it says the profit and loss account needs to be debited and correspondingly the balance sheet needs to be credited. So it says for the profit and loss account needs to be debited, the balance sheet needs to be credited. Now, it says during year Boston impaired one of its factories, the carrying value of the asset attributable to the factory, unit total 3.6. The fair value less cost of disposal and the value in use were estimated at 3 and 3.5 million respectively. And accordingly the asset was written down to 100, 000, by 100,000 to reflect impairment. Audit procedures reveal that management used the growth rates attributable to the company as a whole to estimate value in use using growth rates attributable to factory. The audit team specified the value in use to be 3.1 million. Now you see, you see, what happens is we need to explain the matters which should include, which should be discussed with management in relation to each of the uncorrected MSS statements, uh, including an assessment of their individual impact on financials and uh, assuming that management does not, assuming that management does not adjust any of the misstatement, discuss the effect of the audit opinion on the, uh, discuss the effect on the audit opinion and the auditor's report. Now let's uh, talk about it. Okay, what exactly is it? So we're going to say that number one, this 400,000 divided by the total uh, profit before tax. So the profit before tax is 6400 million. 6.40, you will get the percentage. How much percent is it? Can somebody please calculate the percentage? Okay, 6.35%. So 6.35% is material. 6.35% is material. So number one thing is that it's 6.35% and you need to explain that uh, impairment is when carrying amount is greater than the recoverable amount. We did discuss recoverable amount is higher of fair value less cost to sell and value in use for value in use use risk adjusted specific discount rate use specific risk adjusted discount rate the factory wide rate is inappropriate So if we use a specific rate, then recoverable amount is 3.1 million instead of 3.5 million resulting in further recognition of impairment loss of 0.4 million.
so one of the requirement of the question is you need to explain the matters including an assessment of their individual impact on the financials now for the individual impact on financials Uh, this would result in assets and profits to be overstated by 0 0.4 million. We'll discuss the effect on the audit opinion later on. Now, number two is basically about the borrowing costs. Now, what does it say? It says interest charges of 75 relating to loan taken out during the year to finance the construction of a new manufacturing plant were included in finance charges recognized in profit for the year. The manufacturing plan is due for completion in 2016. So you need to explain that an uh, asset that necessarily takes a substantial period of time to get ready is considered to be a qualifying asset. And uh, interest costs incurred for the construction, acquisition, upgradation of a qualifying asset should become part of cost of such asset. should become part of the cost of such asset. <coughs> so basically, the interest expense recognized in PNL shall be reversed and capitalized as part of cost of asset. Current impact is profits slash assets are understated by 75,000. You could also talk about this uh, 75,000 compared with the total assets of uh, 104 million. So you could have an idea about whether it's material or immaterial. Okay, furthermore, let's talk about the irrecoverable debt. There is the 65,000, it says, one of the Boston company's largest customers, Cleveland, is experiencing financial difficulties. Uh, Janet, yes, we do need to explain. I mean, because you need to just explain the misstatement. Even if it is an immaterial misstatement and uh, the best practices should be suggested that you should uh, rectify the financials. Now, uh, the next situation is, it says one of the Boston company's largest customers, Cleveland, is experiencing financial difficulties. At the year end, Cleveland owed Boston Company $100,000 against which Boston Company made a 5% specific allowance. Shortly after year end, Cleveland paid $30,000 of the outstanding but since experience for the problems leading to their primary lender presenting a formal request that Cleveland be liquidated if successful only secured creditors would like to receive any reimbursement. 
So what we need to do is that we now need to actually uh, understand uh, this basically irrecoverable debt, which is a provision of 5,000 was already recognized. Now this 65,000 divided by total assets of 1 of 4 million, you need to see if it's material or immaterial. Then what you need to do is that you need to say that uh, after year end is an adjusting event as it provides evidence of conditions that existed at year end. So uh, we would say that uh, a bed, uh, in fact, of 100,000, there was already provision of 5,000. There was a recovery of uh, 35,000. So the balance was 65,000. Now it's confirmed bed debt and should be written off following IS 10 and IS IFRS 9. And the last one is during the year Boston purchased 150,000 shares in Nebraska for $4. Boston classified the investment as financial asset at fair value through profit or loss. On 31st December 2015, the shares of Nebraska were trading for 4.29. At the year end, the carrying value of the investment in Boston Company's financials was 600,000. Now, you need to understand that uh, what it is suggesting is investment 43,500. Now, uh, 43,500 divided by the profit before tax of 6.4 million. Profit before tax of 6.4 million, you need to see if it's material or not. Now what next? What you need to do is that you need to say during the year Boston company purchased 150,000 shares in Nebraska for $4 per share. Boston company classified the investment as a financial asset. So we need to actually tell them that uh, if a financial asset is at fair value through p &L, it has to be recorded at fair value at each reporting date and any gain or loss is to be recognized in PNL. Now, if you see at year end, the shares of 4.29 multiply by 150,000 would actually give rise to 643,500. The current carrying amount is just 600,000. So there is actually going to be a gain of 43,500 and should be recognized in p &L.
Okay, now the last part of the question is the implications on the audit report. So you see, if uh, you aggregate all the misstatements, it will become 465 minus 118.5, approximately 346.5 million divided by you could compare this with 6.4 million so it is just going to be uh, material but not pervasive so what would happen is we will stick to a qualified opinion because there are immaterial misstatements there are multiple misstatements but all of them are immaterial so they're going to be a qualified opinion with reference of the matter discussed in the basis for qualified opinion para of the report. Okay, uh, so uh, this is actually how you're going to uh, tackle this question. So we have discussed this question. We have discussed how the scenario is, go is proceeding and how things are moving in this scenario. Uh, anyone has any questions, please go ahead. It's not pervasive because they are uh, all immaterial and it's just the one single misstatement that's material. Uh, so my, I will have them emailed today. Uh, anyways, uh, that's it for today. Uh, see you all tomorrow. We are going to now move forward to the next areas of the syllabus. Yes, Abdul Basir, they can be given with the individual items. Uh, Azimullah, it's just the uh, impairment, that's a material misstatement, otherwise all are immaterial. Kuratulan, uh, uh, can somebody please share the WhatsApp group link with Kuratulan in this group? Uh, Sumaya, we are going to now move forward, we are going to discuss something about the reporting and then we'll move on to the uh, uh, other assurance area. Okay, now, uh, no, Naeem, they don't become aggregate uh, pervasive because they are all, uh, in aggregate also, they are just material. They're not very significant because the point is just the one single item that's causing the problem. Okay, I'll share the link again and I'll ask somebody to actually put it across.
I'll just share the link. Okay, see you all tomorrow.